Can we really be sure that our sins have been washed away? Welcome to Pastor's Point, I'm Dr. Jamie Schmitz. Today's program addresses this question as Pastor Scott Kirsch from Delta Assembly of God in Delta, Ohio, shares his message entitled, You Better Be Sure. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 says that there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. For the Bible also says in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 12, that there are those who are clean in their own eyes. Though there is a generation who is clean in their own eyes, but they have not been washed from their filthiness. It amazes me how many people are so focused on everyday detail of their life. They're from the cradle to the grave, but they give very little attention, very little thought or very little attention to where they will be spending eternity. Eternity is much larger than our time here on earth as we know. The book of James says that it is but a vapor. It is short lived. As soon as it starts, it's nearly over. But ev eternity is forever and there is no end. So if there is no end in eternity, that means that you and I will either live in two, one of two places. Either we will live in a place of pleasure, a place of peace forever, or we will live in a place of pain and torment forever. Uh, the choice is yours, but the decision you make today at this moment may determine where and what your future will be like in eternity. So you better be sure, as you know, where, you better be sure if you know where you're going and how you're going to get there. Some of you are gambling with this, giving little thought uh, to it and, and thinking that it's no big deal where I spend eternity. What makes a difference? I'm living for the here and I'm living for the now. Well, I want you to understand that you are gambling with this. And I want you to know that in this gamble that you're making, the stakes are very, very high. In fact, in Luke chapter 16, we have the story of two men. One who gave little thought for eternity, one who gambled with it, and the other man who knew obviously for sure that he was secure in where he was going to spend eternity. Let's read this uh, from the book of Luke chapter 16 verses 19 through 31. This is a parable from Jesus Christ Himself. And He says in verse 19 that there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who fared sumptuously every day. That means he ate well. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember, child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this between us and you a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, so that they may warn him, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Well, we see in Matthew chapter 16 something very interesting. We see the story of two men. One man was a very wealthy man and he obviously did not know where he was going to spend eternity. The other man was a man called Lazarus, a beggar, who sat at his gate daily and he relied on the scraps from the rich man's table. The Bible says that he, the dogs came and licked his sores. Obviously this man was a beggar. Not only that, but he was also a leper. Well, both of them died about the same time. Well, the day that the, the, the beggar died, Lazarus died, the Bible says he was carried 
by the angels into paradise, which was a place, the precursor to heaven before Jesus went to the cross and opened up heaven to all of us. But it was a place of paradise. It was a place of peace. It was a place of bliss. And he was there by, by Father Abraham. The rich man, unfortunately, died. And the, your Bible says that he went into Hades, a place of torment. We see that there was fire in Hades. We see that there was torment in Hades. He went into Hades and he was in torment there. He looks up and he sees Abraham and he sees Lazarus afar off and he cries out to Father Abraham and he says, Father Abraham, he goes, Take, uh, bring Lazarus here then, and have him dip his finger in water that he may touch my tongue, for I am in torment in these flames. But Abraham said, Son, unfortunately your time has come. You had your choice. You made your decision and now you are in torment. And Lazarus is in paradise. He's in a good place. But Father Abraham, send him, send him to here. Send him to my brother's house to warn him. And Father Abraham said, Son, unfortunately you cannot come here and we cannot go there. There's a chasm, a division between us. So we see a few things about this place of torment. We see a few things about the place of paradise. The place of torment was a, a place of pain. It was also a place where there's flames. It was a place that you don't want to go to. You don't want to be. And there's no way to get out of it until the very end on the day of judgment when those who are there will end up in the next place we need to talk about which is the lake of fire. So it goes from bad to worse. For the Bible says in Revelation chapter 20 verse 14, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So I say to you again, the title of this message of course, from the onset is, you better be sure. I ask you a question, is your name written in the book of life? Now, I know there's two audiences that I'll be speaking to here today. Number one, the audience is those who may stumble across this channel, stumble across this message, and by accident, and they do not know Jesus Christ. They're not saved. They're, 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 they're on their way to Hades. But then there's that other audience that has been in church all of their life. Uh, you were raised in church, you were baptized, you were gone through a lot of religious ceremonies, you were in Sunday school, maybe even now you're a, an adult and you teach Sunday school, or maybe you are even a professional minister, uh, whatever that may look like. Well, those are the two people, the two audiences that, one of, that we all fall into. There's three audiences. There's those of the world, there's those who have been raised in the church, but the question of the hour is this. Wouldn't it be terrible to be raised in the church, to know about God, but not to truly know God, and to get at the end of your life and discover that you were on the wrong path all along, even though you thought you were on the right path? Well, I ask you a question. Is your name written in the book of life? There, because the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, I remind you that there is a way that seems right to a man. It seems right, but the end thereof is death. So you might say, well, tell me, preacher, I need to know, what is this way that you keep talking about? Well, Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You might say, so Jesus is the way, preacher, right? Cool, because I know him. I know all about Jesus. But, well, but the interesting thing about this is not it's so much do you know Jesus, about Jesus, but does Jesus know you? So that's the question of the hour. Because if I show up at the White House and I want to see the president and I knock on the gate and I say, I know the president. I see him on the news. I see him every, everywhere, every day I see him. You might have even voted for him. And you say, I voted for him. I know the president. I want to go in and see the president. They're going to go ask him, do you know so and so? Do you know such and such? And he'll say, no, I never met them. I never knew them. So you're not getting in. You're not being able to go into that place because he doesn't know you. So the question is, it's not so much do you know Jesus, but the question is, does Jesus know you? Because in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, the Bible says, Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do, do the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I would declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, or you who do sin. So, 
You might say, preacher, tell me, what is the way? What is the way? Well, the way is found in the Bible. The, the, the Holy Scriptures from Genesis to Revelation shows us the way. But there's, there's a, a, a more specific way that you can know. It's called the Romans Road. It's the Bible way. And there's four stops on this Romans Road. You may have heard it. For the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, first stop we make is to know that none is righteous, no, not one. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. What does it mean to uh, be righteous or unrighteous? Well, right, to be righteous means that we have never sinned, that we are perfect, that there's no flaw in us, no sin in us. And there's none righteous, no, not one. And the qualification to get into heaven is to be righteous or perfect. So all of us have been excluded because every single one of us has sinned except for God. So therefore, if the requirement to go to heaven, to be right with God, is to be righteous, every one of us has blown that right from the start. Where did this sin come from? Well, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, that therefore just as, uh, just as sin came into the world through one man, that one man is Adam. We understand that in the beginning Adam and Eve walked with God. They talked with Him in the cool of the day. They had a relationship with Him. But then sin entered the world. Adam disobeyed God. He rebelled against God. And as we know the, the rest of the story, that sin came into the world. And according to Romans chapter 5, verse 12, through Adam that sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all men have sinned, each and every one of us. And it, it goes from generation to generation to generation. And that's the reason we die. We were never intended to physically die. And there's two types of death the Bible talks about. There's a physical death at the end of our life because Romans 3, uh, 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. Yes, the wages of sin is death. So there's two types of death the Bible talks about. There's a physical death at the end of our life, a cessation of life because of sin. But the second type of death is what we've already discovered and we've seen in Luke chapter 16 and Revelation chapter 20. It's a place of eternal death, a place of eternal damnation. God doesn't want that for you. So the wages of sin is death. But the good news is this, is the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says this, But God shows, He demonstrates His own love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners. That's good news. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says this, That if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in our heart that God has raised Him from the dead, we shall be saved. That's the good news right there. Number one is to receive Jesus, uh, to come to Jesus as Lord. We don't make Him the Lord of our life. He's already Lord. We receive His Lordship. That means He's the boss. That means we submit to Him. And the rest of that verse goes on to say that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that He is Lord and God raised Him from the dead, we shall be saved. But I want you to understand today that it's not just about saying that prayer or, or saying that scripture from an empty heart. No, no, no. Many people have it up here. They might have said that prayer. They might have repeated that scripture. But they've never been what the Bible talks about being converted. You see, it's, it's not about just saying the prayer. It's not about just quoting that scripture. The Bible says in Acts chapter 3, verse 9, 19, that we are to repent what does it mean to repent? To turn away from our lifestyle, to turn away from our sin, turn away from the world and turn to Jesus. Repent therefore and be what? Converted, that the, your sins may be blotted out so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And it goes along with what Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 3, about being uh, uh, born again. For Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus answered him, and he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? And can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? Of course not. Jesus answered and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, 
and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So you might say, what does it mean to be born again? Well, when you have been, when you repent of your sin, you get converted. God changes you. And here's the good thing about it. You are a new creation. Here's all things have passed away. All your sins are forgiven and washed away. For the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he, they are a new creation, a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So if you're born again, you are a new creature. You have a new nature. You have been regened. Interestingly enough, if I take a pig, you know, this, you've probably heard this before, and I put him in a bathtub, and I can scrub him up, and I can put shampoo all over him, paint his toenails, put a, a, a blue ribbon on his head, and I can call it a poodle all I want. That is not a poodle. That is a pig. Unless, unless something changes inside of him, unless he's regened to have the DNA of a Pudo instead of a pig. Folks, here's the good news. When we get born again, when we're truly converted, we no longer live as we used to live. We are changed. We are regened. We, have the, we be, get the nature of the Heavenly Father. For the Bible says in Titus chapter 3, verse 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. We can't earn our salvation. It's not about our good works. But according to His mercy, He saved us. How? By the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Holy Ghost. So that's why the Bible tells us if, we, if we're in, in Christ, we are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It's t it's, notice what it says, the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus Christ went to the cross for you. He went to the cross for me. He died in our place. He, 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 he shed His blood for you and I. So when we come to Him and we repent, we get washed of our sins. That's the good news. That's the good news. First John chapter 1 verse 7 says this, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1 9 says that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And Ephesians 1 verse 7 says, In Him, in who? Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of trespasses according to the riches of His grace. Folks, that is good news. That is wonderful news. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 12, there is a generation that is right in their own eyes, but they have not been washed of their filthiness. So I ask you again today, have you been washed? Have you been washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Have you been washed in the blood of the Lamb? I'm not asking how many church services you've attended. Those are good things, wonderful things, important things. I'm not asking all of that, uh, if, whether you've gone through this motion, that motion, gone through this ceremony. Those are good, nice things. I, I'm not asking how many scriptures you know. I'm asking, have you been washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are your garments and spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Because what, also what happens when we get born again, when we get converted, we not only get washed, but we get the renewing of the Holy Spirit. In other words, God puts His Spirit on the inside of us when we get saved. That's why the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, He tells, I, and He says, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove your heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Notice it is God who does this. We have really nothing to do with it but surrender and ask Him to do it for us. He literally takes our heart out of us, the old heart, heart of sin, the heart of hate, the heart of, of, of pain, all of that out of us, and He puts a new heart in us according to the Bible. And not only that, but then the next verse in verse 27 says, and He promises that He will put His Spirit within you and cause you to walk in His statutes and be careful to obey His rules. What does that mean? Well, when He puts His Spirit in us, what it, what it does, He puts a new heart in us, and that gives us a heart of, to love Him, to worship Him. And then He puts His Spirit in us, and that Spirit gives us the ability and causes us, according to His Word, to live according to His commands, according to His statutes, according to the Bible. Because it's impossible, nearly impossible, to live according to the Word of God, to follow Jesus without His Spirit working in us 
to make it possible and without having a new heart. You know, some of the most miserable people, the meanest people that I've ever met are church people trying to live the Christian walk and Christian life in their own ability. It's hard. They're miserable. And it shouldn't be. Because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 30, He says, For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Yes, that's right. And in 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, He says, For this is the love of God, the Bible says, that we keep His commandments. You can't keep His commandments without His Spirit. You can't keep His commandments without a new heart. And His commandments are not burdensome. So if, the, if it's burdensome for you to be a Christian and it's hard and it's tough, and it's, maybe you need to go back and ask yourself, have I been washed in the blood? Do I have a new heart? Does His Spirit live within me? Because James chapter 2, verse 17 and 18 says that faith without works is dead. Now, that doesn't mean that we earn our salvation through our good works. We can't. We never will. But you'll show me your faith. The proof of your faith is your lifestyle change, your works. Amen. Amen. For the Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus said this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but, though, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So again, we don't get there by good works. You don't earn your salvation. But the proof that you are saved is the fact that your life has changed. The, the fact that you are serving Jesus, trying to serve Jesus, following Jesus. Amen? And here's the evidence and the proof of it. It's found in Galatians chapter 5. So the things I'm going to read to you next, if you are living these things and these are in your life, then you're probably, not probably, you're definitely not saved. You do not belong to Christ. I don't care how many church services you've attended. I don't care how much of the Bible you know. Because it says in Galatians chapter 5 verse 19, now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, that means sex outside of marriage. Impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, that translates out to mean drug addiction. Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But, verse 22 goes on to say, but here is the fruit of the Spirit. Here is the evidence of your salvation. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. It is peace. It is patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those that belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That is the fruit of the Spirit. It doesn't mean you're perfect, but it means you have more of the fruit, the good things, of God operating in your life than the evil, wicked things. And if you can be happy living in evil, evil, wicked things, you're not born again, my friend. You're not right with God. You're on the wrong path. You've not been washed. For the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11, it's what it says. And do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So there is a way. There is a way that seems right to a man. There is a gener but, but the end thereof is destruction. There is a generation that has not been washed of their filthiness. So I ask you today, are you washed? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Does God's Spirit live within you? Do you have a new heart? Because you can know for sure that you are right with God. You can know for sure because if you look at your life, has there been a change? Are you a new creation? Is it simple and easy to walk according to His Word compared to what before you knew Him? Are you washed in the blood? Here's how you can know for sure. If you cry out to God today, repent and be converted that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Just cry out to God. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that everyone who hears me, everyone who is listening at the sound of my voice that is watching this broadcast, that has heard this word, that you will move their hearts, stir their spirits, bring them to a place of salvation if they're already not saved. 
And if they are already saved, that they'll find a way to share this message for people that need to hear, people that need to know. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your salvation. We cry out to you right now in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. We ask you, Lord, to save us, forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we come to you today. Congratulations. If you sincerely cried out to God, it's not about a prayer, but it's about your heart being stirred, your heart being moved, and knowing for sure that you are right with the Lord, you're on the right path, the biblical path, not man-made path, not what somebody told you, but the biblical path, and that you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, then you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your heart is right with God. I want to encourage you that are watching that know for sure that you're right with God, that know for sure that you've been washed, that you would ask the Lord to help you to be a bold witness to a lost and dying world around you that needs desperately to hear this message of the good news of the gospel, that Jesus Christ came to save us, to deliver us, to set us free, and God, that God may live on the inside of us, give us a new heart, and put His Spirit within us. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause His face to shine upon you. And may the Lord give you peace. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of Pastor's Point. I trust this message has been a blessing to you and hope you consider connecting with this local church. To learn more about Pastors Point, visit wlmb.com forward slash Pastors Point, where you can send us feedback, watch episodes on YouTube, and find a schedule of pastors for this season's episodes. Pastors Point is a local viewer-supported ministry that couldn't exist without the generous support of viewers like you. If this message has impacted you, please consider making a financial gift today and make sure to send us a note about how Pastors Point has made a difference in your life. Thank you for supporting us and helping us bring a variety of life-giving messages right into people's homes through the ministry of Pastor's Point.